Good evening, I'm Peter Mansbridge, and this is The National. Well, there's no money, there's no food even in the market. We are on the scene in South Sudan, where nearly half the people risk starvation, and the world's response falls tragically short. Calls grow for the defense minister to resign. Now, the minister's apology does not repair the damage he created. The prime minister responds. Plus, bouncing back in Fort Mac, one year after the fire that changed everything. Once it's completely finished and we take that first step, it's going to be very, very emotional. You know that feeling when you're hungry, your stomach grumbles, you feel a bit weak, even lightheaded. Well, tonight, half a world away, that feeling for millions is not going away. It's worse and more intense than you can imagine. South Sudan is in the grips of a humanitarian crisis on an epic scale. What's happening on the ground is underreported and ignored. And tonight, you'll see it up close. A place where civil war is tearing the world's youngest country into pieces. As warring sides kill with weapons, a famine spreads, silently starving South Sudan's people. An estimated five million don't have enough food. That's where we're taking you tonight, right into the heart of the East African nation, to Unity State, a region where famine has hit hard. Our Margaret Evans is there, speaking to those who desperately need help and who hope the skies bring what they need to survive another day. An emergency aid helicopter thrumming towards its target in the skies above South Sudan, a land scorched by more than the sun these days. X marks the spot for a massive food drop in the heart of one of the country's two declared famine zones. The people on the ground, more than 20,000 of them, haven't received food aid in a month. The last one was not enough, says a woman named Sarah, clutching ration cards for her group. One card can't help a whole family, she says. Three years of civil war in South Sudan have displaced hundreds of thousands, especially here in Unity State. Civilians say they're paying a terrible price for living in rebel-held territory. Eliza <laughs> Niyakuma's husband was shot dead, she says, when government soldiers attacked her village, burning it to the ground. She hid in the swamps with her five children. <laughs> They sleep when they're too hungry, she says, and I go out and find the leaves of the trees. That's how my children survive, and eating water lilies. Commodity, yellow beef, commodity, yellow beef. My location is one zero. Airdrops are the only option for aid agencies like the World Food Programme, struggling to reach conflict zones and cross vast tracts of territory with few roads. Each time a flight passes, they're dropping enough food to feed 1,500 people for one month. Seven passes today. But the conflict shifts from place to place like a disaffected suitor. The whole country is hurting. <coughs> this is what starvation looks like in the capital, Juba. Teresa is so critical, she needs a feeding tube, still dressed in her best for her trip to the hospital. Four-year-old Bach also has acute malnutrition and tuberculosis on top of that. There is no money for his treatment. Shriven bodies with old souls are everywhere you look, the ward overflowing. Some children on the ground outside, hovering, between a beginning or an end. Yeah, now there's no money, there's no food even in the market, and everyone is in Juba. Former breadbasket states are no longer producing food, and head nurse Betty Achan says those who came to Juba to escape hunger and uncertainty find it here too. You don't know what will happen. You just get yourself the following morning you're coming here. We are just counting days. <coughs> and the deaths 
Four-year-old Bach died two days after we met him, disappearing from sight like those people in the bush waiting for a peace that may never come. Margaret Evans, CBC News, in Unity State, South Sudan. For the youngest, the crisis is staggering. The World Health Organization suggests nearly one out of every 10 children in South Sudan won't make it to their fifth birthday. And that statistics became real overnight as another child we saw in Margaret's piece died. His name is Daniel. He wasn't even two and a half years old. And yet he weighed what a two and a half month old would, 16 pounds. At the children's hospital he was in, 20 kids have died in the past month. In the coming days, we'll have more from South Sudan. Tomorrow, Margaret takes us to the front lines where a UN mission is trying to save people from the atrocities of war. And we'll go deeper with analysts who know the region well. What needs to happen to help this crisis? Coming up. I'm Briar Stewart, just outside of Fort McMurray where the fire ignited last year. One year on, the forest is beginning to regenerate and so is the community of Fort McMurray. Plus, political tensions escalate in France as some voters long for more options. The defense minister remains in his job tonight despite several calls from the opposition today for him to step down or be fired. At issue is a claim Harjit Sajjan made twice on two different occasions about his role in a major military operation in Afghanistan. It was not true. And as Catherine Cullen tells us, critics say his apology is not enough. I would like to uh, apologize uh, for my mistake. I, I deeply regret it. And I'm truly sorry for it. If this whole debate were only about whether Harjit Sajjan is sorry, it would be over. But the big unanswered question is why he said what he said and how much it undermines his credibility with the military and the public. It all revolves around Operation Medusa, a bloody and important battle during the Canadian mission in Afghanistan. Sajjan was a major at the time, playing a liaison role between Canadian commanders and some local Afghan leaders. He was praised for his work but suggested he did far more in this recent speech. And it became the uh, architect of an operation called Operation Medusa. And it turns out Sajjan said that before. In July 2015, he attributed the architect claim to Jonathan Vance, who's now chief of the defense staff. He said that, you know, I was the architect of Operation Medusa, one of the biggest operations um, since, uh, since the Korean War that Canada has led. General Vance wouldn't confirm Sajjan's story. Yep, I'm not really aware of this case. So did Sajjan misrepresent something Canada's top soldier said, a man he has to have a strong working relationship with? The opposition parties have made up their minds. Canadians don't believe him. The military doesn't trust him. A minister of defence who has told a whopper about his record, and that, Mr. Speaker, is not something you would apologize for. It's something that you have to step down for. <laughs> well, the Prime Minister remove the Minister of Defence. Sajjan won't explain why he said what he said. As I stated, I'm not going to be here to make excuses um, I'm, uh, or, or to give reasons for And the Prime Minister is standing by him. He has my full confidence. General Vance, the one Sajjan said called him the architect of Operation Medusa, put out a statement today saying that now that Sajjan has unequivocally apologized, the matter is closed. Sajjan must be hoping that Vance is right about that. Catherine Cullen, CBC News, Ottawa. The Liberals say they are carrying out a campaign promise to modernize the way the House of Commons operates. Probably the most noticeable change for Canadians will be the addition of a Prime Minister's question period, modelled after its British counterpart. But as Hannah Thibodeau tells us, the opposition says by forcing these changes, the Liberals are actually breaking another promise. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau was the only one who responded in question period a couple of weeks ago. 39 questions in 45 minutes. The Liberals want the PM to do this every Wednesday. Typically, he only answers a few questions from opposition leaders. Every member of parliament should be able to ask the Prime Minister a question and receive a response. So it's really about more accountability. 
The opposition say this is a slippery slope, and eventually Trudeau will only show up to QP once a week. Canadians have to work every day. Canadians can't just tell their boss, hey, I want to change my hours. The PM's hours are not the only reform opposition parties are furious about. For the last month, they've been fighting every part of the Liberals' plan for parliamentary reform. Some of the specifics are laughable. The Liberals want to limit the use of omnibus bills. They say it's a tactic the Harper government used and abused. The opposition accused the Liberals of using them too. The next bill that we're about to debate is called an omnibus bill. They choose to call it a budget bill, but it amends the Judges Act. It rolls in two other bills, the artificial intelligence bill and a veterans bill. And I think there's almost 30 bills that are encapsulated in the omnibus bill. Even though opposition parties aren't happy with the proposed changes, the Liberals don't care. These are clear commitments we made to Canadians in 2015. And so we will not give the Conservative opposition a veto on the implementation of these campaign commitments. So Trudeau will be able to tick off one more election promise. But in doing so, the opposition parties say he's breaking another one. We got elected on a platform of collaboration, openness, uh, working together, uh, building uh, a consensus. Uh, and that's exactly what we're focusing on. The opposition says Trudeau and his government are simply trying to ram through these controversial changes before the summer break, adding they'll continue to fight this motion with every procedural tool they have. Of course, they can fight all they want. The Liberals have the majority. Hannah Thibodeau, CBC News, Ottawa. A funeral was held in Winnipeg today for a young woman who was beaten to death in an incident that appeared to be recorded and posted on social media. The body of 19-year-old Serena McKay was found in her home on the Sajkeen First Nation, April 23rd, one day after investigators believe she died. What has happened has affected me on, on so many levels that I know that I never will be the same and that I carry this forward now and that to make positive change in the community. A 16 and 17 year old have been charged with second degree murder in her death. The motive for the killing is not clear. And the body of a boater who went missing last week near Fort Chippewa in Alberta was recovered late Sunday. Walter Ladousseur and three friends set off last week from an area known as Devil's Gate. Their boat was found empty. The search continues for the other men. For many families, sending a child to daycare comes at a high cost. But some parents in Alberta are seeing relief today. The province has launched a pilot project with $25 a day childcare. But as Carolyn Dunn reports, critics say there could be unintended consequences. At the Louise Dean Early Learning and Child Care Centre, young moms are spending precious moments with their children before heading to high school classes. Even though most of these moms get government help, the hefty cost of daycare looms large in their future. It's going to be quite, quite an expense to, to think about every single month. My son is named Stefan. He is one and a half. Even subsidized daycare costs grade 12 student Varia Polipchuk $400 a month. Now with the pilot project, Polipchuk's fees are cut to zero. So I think it's great to be able to get out and do more things with him and, you know, maybe be able to get more toys in here and there and afford clothing and all that. For most of the 1,300 children who will be enrolled in the pilot program, it will cost parents $25 a day per child. That's around $500 a month for five-day-a-week childcare, something this Calgary couple would welcome. They can manage daycare costs for their first child due in a month, but they'd like to add up to two more to their family eventually. That's, that's $3,000 a month, right, if, for three kids. So how, how do you do that if you're, you know... We'd have to space out the kids or work a lot more just to be able to afford day home. Paige McPherson of the Canadian Taxpayers Federation argues it's a costly program that doesn't target the most needy. It ends up subsidizing wealthy families who don't need the money to send their kids to, to daycare, and it increases wait lists for all the other parents. The pilot program is expanding spaces by about 700 province-wide, but proponents say the real benefit is the early learning curriculum. When kids grow up and have that early start, they enter school at grade level, they do well in school, and they do well in life. 
If the three-year pilot project is successful, the larger goal would be to have affordable, universal childcare across Alberta. The province would be counting on tens of millions of promised federal dollars to make that a reality. Carolyn Dunn, CBC News, Calgary. The Premier of Saskatchewan says he's ready to use the notwithstanding clause to fight a recent court ruling on schools. The Court of Queen's Bench ruled last month that the provincial government must stop paying for non-Catholic students to attend Catholic schools. Brad Wall says invoking notwithstanding will protect parents and students and their right to choose the school that works best for them. There were some tense moments in the heart of Toronto's financial district this afternoon. Right in the middle of rush hour, people suddenly saw and heard this. Brown smoke poured from that underground grate for more than an hour. Firefighters say a hydro vault exploded and caught fire. No one was hurt, but the area was shut down for hours. Toronto Fire was investigating the heavy rain that fell all day as a possible cause. People in a province, a territory, and a U.S. state were shaken awake by a couple of earthquakes this morning. The 6.2 quake struck just after 5.30 this morning in northern British Columbia. It was followed by several strong aftershocks that were also felt in Yukon and Alaska. There were no injuries or major damage. Straight ahead, Donald Trump flatters a dictator and raises concerns with his freestyle diplomacy. It's not fashionable these days to spend too much time or enthusiasm arguing that there are differences between men and women. We've spent a lot of time denying that any differences exist. You can get into a lot of trouble claiming anything else. I'd like to suggest there's an immutable universal truth, an undeniable behavior pattern that separates the sexes. It involves yogurt containers. Women save them, men throw them out. A lot of bands and parades like these represent police forces and cadet groups, things like that. This is the story of a different kind of band. Meet the Top Hat Marching Orchestra from Burlington, Ontario. In this parade, they're a little older, a little wiser, and a little lost. I've always been a little out of step with most of my colleagues who work in this racket called journalism. Most of my friends want to write for the front pages, want to chase the big stories. The stories I like best are the ones where there's no plot to begin with, no headlines, no news pegs. One thing you learn when you poke around off stage long enough is that people love to talk. Another thing you learn is that if you stick around long enough, and you listen hard enough, everyone has something worth saying. I owe you next. Oh, okay. <laughs> a, a Madagascar kissing cockroach. It looks like a beetle. Or like a cigar, the end of a cigar. He's going to grow to be six inches, Peter. And you don't have to He's walk got him. Six inches, I know. <laughs> and all you have to do is name him and watch him grow. <laughs> Get in there, you little sick cockroach. Stuart McLean. Thank you very much. In Moose Jaw. You know, the great British statesman Winston Churchill once said that success is going from one failure to another without losing enthusiasm. <laughs> but there's got to be a limit. I had a cow who couldn't learn her lines, a, a little girl who thought she was starring in a beauty pageant, the set wouldn't fit through the doors, Joseph was covered with scabs, <laughs> and I was worried that I was coming down with the chicken pox. So when I'm writing, uh, I, I, I'm always trying uh, to take people to the place of laughter, but also to uh, the place where laughter meets tears. rescue in storm-ravaged East Texas. A group of strangers pulled a father and two young children, one of them a baby, from an overturned truck just as floodwaters threatened to drown them all. The family's now on the mend. Vicious storms in the American South and Midwest killed at least a dozen people over the weekend. 
People pack the streets and cities around the world today, marking May Day and International Workers' Day. But many were in no mood to celebrate. Londoners protested against the Tory government as much as they championed the workers of the world. Turks voiced deep concern over recent government crackdowns. And Venezuelans marched both for and against the government as their economy crumbles. But it was Paris where political tensions really boiled over. In less than a week, France must choose a new leader, an ancient of the established middle ground, or a radical disruptor bent on ripping the country out of the EU. Today, those opposed to far-right leader Marine Le Pen unleashed their anger. Nala Ayed reports. Too urgent to leave just to the ballot box. They bring their will to the streets. The France they imagine should have no room for the extreme right. I'm too scared of what could happen if Le Pen would pass, so I'm, I'm going to be voting the next Sunday. The urgency, now less than a week out, is in all the ranks in this battle. Marine Le Pen wants France to think of her rival as complicit in its decay. La réalité, elle est simple. The reality is simple, she says. Emmanuel Macron is just François Hollande, who is clinging on to power like a barnacle. Upstart Emmanuel Macron charged the Front National of being the anti-France party. Because what it stands for is the inevitable collapse of what it is that made France, he says. De ce qui a fait la France. May 1st, days away from what could be a convulsive election, is a place France has been before. Back in 2002, Le Pen's father was up for president. The crowds were bigger, even more urgent. The right way? This Canadian-French uh, couple US were at the protest then and now. When there was Le Pen Chirac for the second round, and we came with our children, it was so important. And Le Pen represents, in this election, for me, the banality of evil, that you can have these very extreme views, and somehow they can become mainstream, and they're kind of equal. But we don't agree with that. Yet there are those who agree. But unimpressed by the candidates, they've come to the streets this past week in the name of rejecting both. The neither nor crowd are doing battle with an impossible choice. Dissenters like this woman, who won't be casting a vote come Sunday. Because I have the impression that I have to choose between a swindler and a thief, she says. It is all a signal of a wider problem of growing French disinterest, of being perpetually fed up with the status quo. Uh, they are not just disappointed. They are on the eve, or on the brink of uh, seceding from society. But the biggest possibility is that they will just stay on and not vote anymore. Not them. They came simply to be heard. Maybe this will make a difference. But drowned out inevitably by a smaller group of protesters who hijacked the march, leaving a different image. France's most dangerous battle isn't here or just at the ballot box. It's really in what comes after. Nala Ayed, CBC News, Paris. And from one divided republic to another, U.S. President Donald Trump rarely goes a day without saying something controversial, often by political design. But his new overtures to some of the world's most notorious strongmen are now causing concern. Lindsay Duncombe has more. Donald Trump was being deliberately provocative with his North Korea comments. He admitted as much to the reporter asking him questions. He knew exactly as he told us what he told us that he was making news. In fact, he said, I'm breaking news, huh? Speaking of dictator Kim Jong-un, Trump said, if it would be appropriate for me to meet with him, I would absolutely, I would be honored to do it, stressing it would have to be under the right circumstances. Over the weekend, North Korea tested another missile. State propaganda like this leaves little doubt of the motivation here. Hardly the basis for a friendly chat. 
I said, absolutely, why not? But it shouldn't be a surprise Trump thinks he can make an in-person peace pitch. He campaigned on it. Who the hell cares? I'll speak to anybody. Who knows? There's a 10% or a 20% chance that I can talk him out of those damn nukes, because who the hell wants him to have nukes? Trump's defenders applaud his unconventional approach. He's willing to break tradition, particularly when he thinks it's for the good of the country. And at a very young age, he was able to assume power. But some see a disturbing pattern. Over the weekend, Trump called the North Korean leader a smart cookie and had a, quote, friendly phone call with another leader known for his brutality. Rodrigo Duterte, president of the Philippines, got an invitation to the White House. That our president compliments that sort of leader and that he also compliments the leader of North Korea troubles me and leaves me concerned about the direction that President Trump is taking. It fell to White House spokesperson Sean Spicer to explain again what the president meant. He stressed conditions are not right for the two leaders to meet, at least not right now, and called on North Korea to ratchet down its provocative behavior immediately. Lindsay Duncombe, CBC News, Washington. Coming up next, some people in Fort Mac are still tested by tragedy. You don't know if you want to live here or move on. You don't know what to do. Briar Stewart hears stories of hardship and perseverance one year after wildfires sparked an exodus. Plus, Donald Trump helps fuel a backlash against gun control. Time to check today's business numbers. The TSX fell by 10 points. The dollar was up very slightly. In New York, the Dow lost 27 points. The price of oil fell 59 cents a barrel.
Natural disasters can fundamentally alter a city, divide the past from the future. Think the San Francisco earthquake, Hurricane Katrina in New Orleans, add Fort McMurray to that list. One year ago, a wildfire forced 90,000 people from their homes. Entire neighborhoods were destroyed and lives were changed forever. Briar Stewart went back to Fort Mac to examine the city and life one year after the fire. Even early on, there were signs that it could all get very bad. The West Fire is our main concern. Within hours, the fire swept into the city. Those initial moments of chaos seared into the minds of those who not only saw, but felt the scorching heat on their way out of Fort McMurray. We should go. It's gonna work out. Before the fire took hold with its unpredictable and unrelenting grip, it started off the way so many wildfires do, in the forest. There's no road that leads to this spot, but from the air you can see the fire's blackened route. It all began around 10 kilometers southwest of Fort McMurray. Take a look at this. This is ground zero. This is where the fire started last May. The charred trees mark the beginning of a path of so much destruction. The fire started here along this trail, frequently used by those driving quads and ATVs. Investigators may never know what caused the fire, but we do know this. Lives were changed. And as the forest begins to regenerate, so does the community of Fort McMurray. One year on, it's impossible to label just where this city is at. People's experiences vary widely. Some have rebuilt, even moved on, but others still struggle to reclaim what the fire took. This was the view at Centennial Trailer Park on May 1st of last year. Perched on the edge of the forest, it was the first area in the city to burn, and all Joanne Bates could do was watch in horror. So we lost everything up. We all have what we have on our backs. I get chills watching that. Bates has seen this moment many times before. Even a year later, friends continue to stumble upon it online and send it her way. Still, it's wincingly painful to watch. But that's our place blowing up. How much do you think about that day still? Oh, I try not to, but there's always moments that bring you back to that. You could be walking in the store and it's like you'll see something that you had or you'll say, well, I had that, you know, like I don't have it anymore. So how long were you living in this RV for? We were living for five months in here. Bates and her partner bought this RV after the fire. They parked it wherever someone would let them. The campground they once called home still hasn't reopened. But one year on, the RV is now up for sale and they're renting a home. Work is slow, but at least we, we have a roof over our head and we're back in Fort Mac. <laughs> That's the main thing. She's living in Gregoire, a neighborhood just across the highway from the trailer park. It was one of the first areas to be evacuated as the fire approached. That's where Carl Moore and his business partner, Rebecca Irving live. They run a company that operates vacuum and water trucks. They, like thousands of others, left as the fire swept in. But Carl returned with a retrofitted truck designed to pump water. We saw him and his team test it that day when they went back into the fire. Like it was pretty chaotic then. We were just going with the water. We didn't have any breathing apparatuses or anything. And like every, you know, it was plastics, chemicals, propane, everything burning. Without knowing it, I guess we sucked it in. And he believes all that toxic smoke has affected his lungs. Since the fire, he's had problems breathing, making it difficult to get through a full day on the floor. Another issue, the yard is packed with trucks and equipment, a sign that business is down. It's been a very long year, very tiresome between running around, trying to deal with insurance, trying to get back to work and find work as well. You know, it's been slower. Some of it's got to do with the fire, yeah. Uh, some, some of it's just because of the economy. 
like directly from the fire, you know, I'd say we lost half to three quarters of a million. Because before Fort McMurray was struck by disaster, it was dealing with the downturn. The municipality estimates that around 5,000 people haven't returned to Fort McMurray because they've lost their homes or jobs, in some cases, both. For sale signs stick out from the dirt on empty lots, part of the changed landscape now in Beacon Hill. After the trailer park, this was the next neighborhood the fire hit. It backs onto the forest, making it serene, yet vulnerable. It was here where Anthony Hoffman grew up. As a firefighter, he spent days scrambling from one burning house to another. I finally got a, a breather one evening, and yeah, I just took my car up here and came to see it for the first time. Before the fire, he was renovating it because his family wanted to sell the house. Soon, it will just be the lot on the market. We're picking up, open a wound a little bit that's that's all finally started to heal. So, some people are just, in my, myself included, we're we're moving on. Along with all he lost last year, he believes there was something he gained. The kind of perspective you only get when you go through something traumatic. It's been a good year for me in terms of realigning my priorities, getting closer to family. You're able to relate on a deeper level with someone who's going through something that hurts because you've done it. But not everyone is in a position where they're so willing to reflect. For some, the discussion around the year that was is still painful. It was one of the worst difficult years I ever went through in all my life, to, to be honest. It has been very up and down. Angelina Gionet is running a francophone daycare in the cramped quarters of this church basement because the school they used to be in was heavily damaged by smoke. It's located in Abasan. The neighborhood is separated from Beacon Hill by the Hanging Stone River, but it was futile when it came to stopping the advancing fire. Nearly 350 buildings were destroyed here, including the home GNA rented. Abbasane, it was, it is my place, and uh, I'm not living there no more, and I, um, I, and I miss that. And she misses all that space the daycare used to have. When they opened in this basement in the fall, she had to tell 30 families there was no longer room for their children at the daycare. Not only had people lost homes, but they lost the services and support they depended on. It's difficult when you have to tell families that you, you can't not offer them services, especially if they can't not go anywhere else. As you would expect, Gione is all smiles when it comes to playtime with the children. But just ask where her mind will be on May 3rd, the anniversary of when the fire roared into the city. Well, it's a different matter. She doesn't want to be anywhere near Fort McMurray that day. I just want to go over that part. I just want to, uh, sorry. <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't want to think about it. I just want the service to go back. They all no trying to have that new normal that they're talking about and try to go one day at a time like we did for the whole year. That term, the new normal, is something you frequently hear. An acknowledgement that even for those who didn't lose a home, things have changed. Take the controlled burns that happen every year. They're a routine part of spring. But this season, they started earlier. And people were told about them ahead of time because of the concern that they could spark fear. While the sight of smoke may be a temporary trigger for some, for others, the reminders are glaring as obvious now as they were last year. And the solarium was at the back, right at the back. Despite what the sign says, it would be wrong to label Mike Ryan's home as a construction site because there's no work going on here. His property is located in the rural hamlet of Safray Creek, about 25 kilometers southeast of the city. The fire ravaged it one day after consuming other neighborhoods in Fort McMurray. It's quite an eerie feeling actually walking through here thinking about that. Uh, just thinking about uh, all the things that have gone. Yeah. Every time you make that trip down the driveway and you look out and you see all of this, it goes through your mind, Mike. 
well, uh, I just think about uh, life itself, you know, it's, uh, it's pretty rough. Which is why it's sadly ironic that amidst all the debris and ash on his property, this mug was the only thing Ryan was able to salvage from his home. On his property sits a melted car and some charred equipment. He hasn't started rebuilding because he's still trying to settle his claim with his insurance company. Stress is an understatement sometimes when you, you get up every day and you, you can't figure out what, uh, what your future is. You don't know if you want to live here or move on. You don't know what to do. Are you asking yourself those questions now? All the time, every day. Ryan is far from the only one who made little progress in the past year. Of the 1,600 buildings destroyed in the fire, permits have been issued to rebuild less than half of them. Some blocks are still mostly barren, but others have already been transformed. This neighborhood in Timberley is on the northwest side of Fort McMurray. It was one of the last areas in the city to burn, but it's perhaps the furthest along when it comes to rebuilding. You look around from a year ago when we were all out back here and the devastation, the tears, the, the emotions and stuff. And then you fast forward a year when people are moving home it, and the amount of houses that have went up in, in the, just in a year. It's just amazing. Trevor Rousel used to work in the oil patch, but now is helping to rebuild his own neighborhood. We first met him last year. First look at the house, it's after the fire. There it used to be. The day he and his wife were allowed back in to see the damage firsthand. That little chunk of land that I paid a lot of money for, a lot of sweat, blood, tears went into it, that's mine, I'm building my house back there. One year later, he's back at his property and there's his house, nearly ready for moving. The finishing touches are being handled by a relative. My father-in-law has uh, strictly forbidden uh, me and my wife going into the house at this point. Um, so once it's completely finished and we take that first step in and, and the first night we stay in there, it's going to be very, very emotional. He plans to be back in his house to mark the one-year anniversary of the fire by holding a barbecue for family and friends. It's one step closer to, to being able to say hi to my neighbor. That's the biggest change I see in this whole year. The communities are starting to look like communities again, not just a wasteland. Rousel knows how fortunate he is. For some, the pace of rebuilding feels achingly slow. Particularly when you consider how quickly it was all destroyed. At the trailhead that leads to where the fire began stands a new sign warning about how easily fires can start and spread. Everyone here is reminded of that every day, whether they're about to move into a brand new home or are still struggling to get past the devastation left by the fire's erratic path. Briar Stewart, CBC News, Fort McMurray. Well, speaking of Briars, it's been nearly a year since these two first met. Briar Briscoe was named after Briar Stewart. She was born several weeks after her parents fled Fort Mac. The little girl is doing well and will celebrate her first birthday on May the 18th. Up next, the fight to allow more guns in California. One man argues it will make people safer. Uh, Cohen is a Canadian poet, novelist, and despite an air of frail vulnerability, he's a very confident young man. I feel free when I'm singing. Do you make up your own songs? Hmm. I uh, always thought of myself as a singer and uh, kind of got sidetracked into literature. Can you sing? Well, I think that if the song is really good and it's your own, then uh, what comes out is music. But now another stranger seems to want you to ignore his dreams as though they were the burden 
love another. Oh, yes. Well, I'd feel pretty lousy if I were praised by uh, a lot of the people that have uh, come down pretty heavy on me. I cannot stand what I become. You much prefer the gentleman I was before. Well, I always felt that my work was more eccentric and uh, that uh, if it touched the mainstream from time to time, I would be lucky. I remember you well in the Chelsea Hotel. You were famous, your heart was a legend. All right, it is Mr. Leonard Cohen! You know, it's only in a country like this that I could get the male vocalist of the year. <laughs> Well, I don't know. People have called me the pessimistic, you know, but I, I think the pessimist is someone who's, who's waiting for it to rain. You know, and I, I feel completely soaked to the skin. So... <laughs> it's closer time. Sometimes I see myself in the midst of it, or I catch sight of myself in the mirror, you know, this old guy in his underwear, you know, kind of trying to find the rhyme for orange and, uh, you know, playing the same phrase on his guitar 15, 20, 90 times, trying to get it right. And there's something uh, uh, absurd about that, but, uh, you know, the nature of work is repetition. And do you come up with a rhyme for orange? Uh, um, door hinge. The state of California already has some of the strictest gun laws in the U.S. And after the 2015 shooting at a San Bernardino community center, they had moved to make them even stronger. But with the election of Donald Trump and his unflinching support of the National Rifle Association, gun owners in the state feel they have the ammunition they need to challenge the new laws in court. Kim Brunhuber explains. There's no way around it. Tommy Bushnell is having a bad day at the range. It's not too good of a grouping there. That's quite atrocious. <laughs> maybe it's because there's a guy standing next to him holding a video camera, or maybe it's because we've been talking about gun control in California and the fact that the gun he's holding right. became a whole lot tougher to get. So I'm gonna go ahead and break down the AR-15 so I can show it to you. It's the same type of gun that was used to kill 14 people in San Bernardino. In the wake of the 2015 mass shooting, state legislators passed a series of laws known to California's gun community as Gunmageddon. The state banned high-capacity magazines and targeted some so-called assault weapons. It looks like a weapon that they would use in the military. Uh, that it does. They're just banning something by its appearance. And then honestly, it's not going to operate any differently than yeah. the Glock, than the HK, than you know, the Beretta. But now California's gun owners are getting some high caliber backup. Friday, Donald Trump became the first president to address the National Rifle Association since Ronald Reagan. As your president, I will never ever infringe on the right of the people to keep and bear arms, never ever. 
The NRA spent $30 million to help get Donald Trump elected. Now it says it will spend whatever it takes to defeat gun control in states like California. It's launching several lawsuits against the ban. This is what democracy looks like. And now a further blow for advocates of gun control. A new study shows that after the shootings in Newtown and San Bernardino, California saw huge spikes in handgun sales. So this was a, a large number of weapons that came into the ecosystem that we estimate would not have were it not for these uh, shocks to the public uh, conscience. And that's okay with Bushnell. He says the problem in California isn't that there are too many guns, it's that there aren't enough. Banning guns, and in general on these laws, they just hurt the law-abiding citizen. In other words, he says, more guns make people safer. And finally, he has a president who believes this too. Kim Brunhuber, CBC News, Los Angeles. Straight ahead, a Bible, a battlefield, and a mystery that spans a century. The answers await right after this break. Each working day of the year throughout Canada, the post office handles about 10 million pieces of mail. The men who face the gigantic task of sorting this mass of mail must know the names of 13,000 cities, towns, and villages in Canada. In the last decade, its reputation for quick, dependable service has been smashed by literally hundreds of labor disturbances. Its deficit has risen to an astonishing $600 million a year, and its automation program is so far behind schedule, no one can estimate when it'll be finished. Canadians are losing patience. They're increasingly fed up, and so am I. The post office will become a crown corporation. In rural communities across Canada, the post office is more than a place to buy stamps and pick up your mail, and this one is no exception. It's, it's really the center of the village. But Canada Post says it loses money. These new super boxes will replace Verna Dunlop. There's no contact with an, uh, an aluminum box and a key. We want to have a community life. About 30 groups of angry residents from across Canada kicked off a national campaign today to get rid of super mailboxes. Anne Derrett lives in Markham, just north of Toronto. She doesn't get home mail delivery. Every weekday, either she or her husband trudges about 100 meters to the neighborhood mailbox. Derrett hates that trek so much, she helped found RAM residents against mailboxes. Ram Mulrooney mailboxes. Well, the post office delivered something today it hasn't been able to for 30 years, a profit. Canada Post says it made almost $100 million in the past year, and it expects even bigger profits in the future. Canadians are making fewer trips to the mailbox. This is the main culprit, email, now as mainstream as a Hollywood blockbuster movie convincing the millions of Canadians who use it to come back to so-called snail mail won't be easy. Why would I want to mail a letter and post it then go to the, mail, to the mailbox? Why? Big change for many Canadians. The end of home mail delivery in urban centres. On doorsteps across the country today, there came plenty of reaction to the big changes at Canada Post. I like to have things delivered and everyone cuts back and it's so silly. Like the milkman a generation or more ago, the days of daily visits from your friendly letter carrier will soon seem like a quaint notion from another era. The National. The National. Hi, I'm Erin Krako from One Calls the Heart, and you're watching CBC. See you next summer. Well, that's what it sounds like when 18,000 Oilers fans sing the Star Spangled Banner. Country singer Brett Kissel was supposed to perform the American National Anthem at last night's game in Edmonton, but the microphone malfunctioned. So the crowd of Canadians took over. 
Sidney Crosby had to leave tonight's game against the Washington Capitals after taking a hit to the head. It was actually two hits, first a high stick from Alex Ovechkin, then a big cross-check from defenseman Matt Niskanen. Niskanen drew a five-minute major. Crosby struggled for a little bit, but was eventually able to leave by himself. His history with concussions has kept him off the ice in past seasons. Well, not much survived the battlegrounds of the First World War, so when a man came across a piece of history that didn't belong to his family, he set out to find its true owners, a journey that brought him to Quebec. The CBC's Leah Hendry has that story. You fellows are a long way from the great state of Texas. Several thousand kilometers, actually. It's a trip Andy Carr and his brother insisted on making, all to show Brian Derrick a Bible that's had an extraordinary journey of its own. My mother's kept it protected for years. It belonged to Carr's great uncle, Gaston de Launay, a French military officer who picked it up on a battlefield in Ypres, Belgium in 1915. This page says, my God, uh, keep, protect, and guide you. But the dedication inside was to someone else. To a friend and volunteer, Herbert B. Naylor. Intrigued, Carr, a retired U.S. Army captain, poured through archival information. He believes Naylor was Herbert Vaughn Naylor, a Canadian soldier from Noyen, Quebec, who fought and died in northern France during the First World War. It's unclear how the Bible ended up on the Ypres battlefield two months later, but Naylor's battalion did move into that area after he died. Carr says he felt obligated to find Naylor's descendants. I haven't lost a brother, uh, but I've, I've lost friends in, in war, so I, I know what it's like. To help in his search, Carr contacted CBC Montreal. After sifting through archives, census data, and a family tree, we found Naylor's great nephew, Brian Derrick. Those are all the family names. Derrick brought along his great uncle's war medals and met the Cars at the Naylor family's church in Noyant, south of Montreal. That it survived amidst the muck and gore and massive uh, world, world War I trench is nothing short of uh, remarkable. Both Derek and Carr hope the Bible will end up in a museum one day with Naylor's medals. But for now, Carr is planning another trip with the Bible, this time to the cemetery in France where Naylor is buried. As a Gulf War veteran, he says he feels a kinship with Naylor. People go off to war and they don't come back, but sometimes their keepsakes do. And it means a lot to the family when they come home, even if the soldier doesn't. Leah Hendry, CBC News, Noya, Quebec. It's not exactly a page-turner, but the Senate of Canada has released a children's story. The Council of Animals represents the House of Commons. It's full of disagreeing foxes and squirrels who govern the forest of Canada. A lioness from across the ocean is a stand-in for the Queen. As for the senators, they are wise owls chosen to keep an eye on the other animals. The tale is described as a whimsical fable. That's the Nationalist Monday night. For news at any hour, you can always go to our website, cbcnews.ca. I'm Peter Mansbridge. Thanks for watching.